Awesome. Well, super excited to be up here with Chris Cummins. If everyone could give Chris a warm welcome. So I, I don't want to steal Chris's thunder, so I'll, I'll let him introduce himself in a second. Uh, but I just wanted to share why we invited Chris uh, out here to be our featured guest speaker at the summit. Uh, so for the, for the past 30 years, Chris has been driving value creation in his businesses and has been an inspiring leader. Uh, he's worked at, in general management roles at companies that we admire, like Danner Corporation. And he's currently the president and CEO of Micronix and an operating partner at Van Street Capital. Uh, Chris and I were put in touch through a, a mutual connection, and I'm always looking to learn from people that are further down the path uh, than I am about how they have led businesses. And in that first call, we hit it off, and I learned a ton from uh, Chris, and I invited him out to the summit, and he was nice enough to come join us. And I just wanted to make sure that you know, what I learned from that conversation, we could share with this, this group. So excited for all of us to learn from uh, Chris today. I'll, I'll give, let, let Chris introduce himself, but I do want to give one teaser, which is that his business grew EBITDA 218% last year at scale, and three quarters of that was organic growth. Uh, so just to give you a sense of the kind of results that, that Chris is driving, uh, and he's doing it in a really special way. Uh, so today's discussion, we're gonna break it down into four parts. We're gonna start with Chris's background, uh, and then we're gonna go into his leadership style and talk about leadership. Then we're gonna go into value creation, and then the last section is we wanna give the audience an opportunity to ask Chris some questions. So start thinking about your questions as we go. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand and ask Chris a question at the, the end. So why don't we get into it and kick it off with maybe just sharing your five minute story, go back to where you grew up to today. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks to the Evergreen Services Group for having me here. Uh, I had a great time yesterday evening, I had a chance to talk to a handful of you. Um, so, you know, my background, pretty, uh, pretty similar to some of the people I've met uh, over the last 24 hours. I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, I grew up in the state of Indiana in a rural community area. Um, and I say that because, you know, people say, what's the big deal about the Midwest? Well, in the Midwest, you know, it's uh, every day is a little bit of a challenge. All right. There's nothing simple about what goes on in the middle of uh, the cornfields and soybean fields and the factories and things of that nature. And it was a great way to grow up. Um, my, my dad was a factory worker. So uh, we had a large farm, but we leased that out. So I was always working and doing something in the mornings before school, after sports, after school. So that work ethic is kind of an early on thing. And I was lucky, you know, I, I was born into that to some degree, right? And um, was able to kind of continue to build off of that throughout my career. And, um, you know, grew up, growing up in Indiana, the opportunities uh, to, to fix things, solve things, um, work on things, help your neighbor, those are all kind of everyday types of things. So uh, having grown up there, played sports um, back in the day, you know, 30 plus years ago, having grown up in the 70s and 80s, you played all the sports. You know, you played basketball, football, baseball, you ran track and whatever else you could do, do and get in trouble and steal your dad's truck at night and take off to the cornfields and things like that, right? So that was a great way to grow up and uh, growing up there um, and also later in high school during the summertime working at my dad's factory he worked for chrysler um, and so working there in the summertime running machines learning how to measure things solve problems keep up a tempo work 60 hours a week and as a young kid you know 16 years old you can kind of think back making 16 17 dollars an hour back in those days that was that was real money you know you work three months in the summertime you walk out that summer with you know ten thousand dollars which was again big money so loved that. It was a great part of uh, my early childhood. Um, went through school, loved school, loved math, loved science. I kind of parlayed that into attending Purdue University. Um, studied electrical engineering, got my degree from, uh, from that university. Had a great time there. Uh, worked part time while going to school, joined a fraternity, continued to play intramural sports, stayed out of trouble mostly, uh, graduated mostly on time. And um, after that, utilized the Purdue's uh, really very um, structured and organized interview process with many companies coming on campus on the mall. And you'd interview with 10 or 20 companies in a period of one or two weeks and secondary interviews. And ended up getting a job offer when I graduated in 1992 to go out to California. And, uh, you know, whatever job they had offered me, I'd have probably taken it, you know, to California. That was, that was a big deal. Uh, I started off as a production supervisor working for a company called Robert Shaw Controls, an industrial controls manufacturing company. They were hiring 
young engineers like myself to bring process, to bring problem solving, to help bring new eyes to the shop floor. It was a fairly traditional machine shop assembly operation in Long Beach, California, a UAW factory. Um, so a lot of rules, a lot of home base, a lot of tenure. Uh, that was like motherhood and apple pie to the employees that were there, 400 plus employees in that factory. And it was a great opportunity. And it was really a foundational opportunity for me coming out of college to start applying some of the things I learned in college, but really learn how a business works. And this is a company that was in a bit of distress. They hired a new general manager. Uh, he was brought there to help turn it around and to bring what then in the 90s was still a fairly new concept around what they called continuous improvement and the Toyota production system and lean manufacturing, words that back then a lot of companies weren't talking about. That was still very much um, something that companies more in Japan, primarily Toyota, was, was doing. But it was starting to make its way over to North America. So very fortunate to you know, start off on a shop floor, learn how to deal with people the most important part of any job, as I'm sure all you know or are learning. Um, getting their attention, getting their respect, um, learning from them, um, establishing communication, expectation, and then starting to take these tools that we were starting to be taught, these consultative tools from people who had worked at Danaher or had worked at Toyota, came on board and really for a period of three to four years, they were our coaches, our, our teachers, our mentors, uh, to make sure we had the right process in place, teach us the tools of daily management, what kind of metrics should we have in the business? How do we take those things and value stream map our process? Focus first on the shop floor, because that's kind of the easy wins, get people's attention and improve quality, improve cost, improve productivity. But over the period of three or four years, we took that into the back office. How do we do AR? How do we do engineering change notices? How do we innovate? How do we design things to have fewer parts? Um, things of that nature that really also started creating a lot of value in our company. And, um, over a period of six and a half years um, with that company, I was able to progress from a production supervisor to a manufacturing manager having multiple departments, to then getting a chance to run the engineering department for that company, then progressing from that to being a strategic business unit or a small business unit manager, having a little bit of P&L experience with a, a small part of the, the overall Robert Shaw controls. And then three or four years later, uh, ended up company is able to be a plant manager at a pretty young age in my kind of mid twenties, which, you know, no one's ever prepared for that, but they took a risk uh, and gave me that opportunity and really enjoyed that. And so that was a great foundation. So that was kind of my early years and kind of then fast forward, you know, hit the fast forward button and 30 years later, <laughs> you know, here I am. And I'd be remiss without saying why I was out in California, of course. Uh, I met my wife, uh, a girl from New York, um, who thought I was just a country kid and took pity on me. And, uh, you know, 30 years later, we're still together. Uh, and since that time, you know, not just the career that's been important, but we've had a great marriage for 26 plus years. I uh, have two young uh, boys uh, at this point now, both in college, both in business school, both taking different paths, but loving the finance side for one boy, the data analytics and systems for the other kid. Um, they both play sports, so we've been really fortunate to, to have a good balance of you know, my good career and my wife's good career early on, and then now a great family as well. That's, that's very important to have that balance. So that's a little bit about me, and over that 30 years, I've had opportunities to work for multiple companies, medical device companies, bauxite mining companies, aerospace and defense companies. Um, worked for, as, as Jeff pointed out, a company called Danher Corporation, ran a couple operating companies for them. Great opportunity, we'll talk more about that later, I think, and kind of the value creation process that I learned from the Danaher team and Larry Culp. Um, but uh, really fortunate to have had a great uh, journey so far. I don't think I've still got some, some more miles to put into this, but uh, it's been great and uh, really enjoyed it.